Good afternoon. Welcome to the Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Carolyn Gannett, and I am the manager here at the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. At least once a month, PCAP asks someone to present, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk at a particular venue, on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. This presentation will also be uploaded on our YouTube channel, and a link should be available later today. Please feel free to pass the link around to anyone you know that would be interested or couldn't make it today to today's webinar. This week is Native Prairie Appreciation Week. Saskatchewan is the only jurisdiction in North America that proclaims Native Prairie Appreciation Week. Um, in addition to this webinar, we also have a few fun things happening, like the Native Prairie Photo Contest we have on our Facebook page. If you have a few minutes, please check out the photos and vote for your favorites. We also have a checklist on our website that you can complete. Um, there are just fun activities that get you outside, appreciating nature, native prairie, and that kind of thing. And you can send in your checklist once it's completed uh, for a chance to win a prize. There are 62 people registered for this webinar, so that's great. Thanks for tuning in. We are working on lining up a presentation in July, so stay tuned for that announcement. Uh, the registration link for our next speaker series presentation that will take place via webinar will be listed on our newsletter and social media outlets, so keep your eyes open for that. If you have any questions during the presentation, on the left-hand side of the webinar pop-up, um, there is a place to type in questions, and I will moderate questions at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to type your questions during the presentation. It shouldn't affect Chris at all. Uh, I would like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this presentation was given by the Nature Conservancy. This project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now a bit about Chris. Chris Helzer is the Director of Science for the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska. During his 20 years as an ecologist, land manager, writer, and photographer, Chris has studied the incredible complexity of prairie organisms, their interactions, and their responses to management and restoration work. His primary job today is to evaluate prairie management techniques and use captured lessons to help managers and landowners adapt their strategies to better build and maintain biodiversity and ecological resilience. In addition, Chris is devoted to communicating the beauty and conservation value of prairies to a wide audience. His blog, The Prairie Ecologist, is widely read by landowners, land managers, and prairie enthusiasts. And his prairie management book, Ecology and Management of Prairies, was published in 2010. Chris lives with his family in Aurora, Nebraska, where he field tests his, field sales, his prairie sales pitches on his children and friends. And with that, I will pass control to Chris, and he can get started. All right. Carolyn, can you still hear me? Yes. And Excellent. your screen. Perfect. All right. Well, I apologize that you can't see me. I'm, I'm really well dressed today. My pocket square matches my bow tie, which complements my coat uh, perfectly. I'm definitely not wearing cargo pants and a ratty t-shirt um, because I'm a professional and I'm here to present something. So, hi everybody. Um, I appreciate the chance to talk to you. I'm going to talk today about the little things in prairies and in nature in general and why they're important. Um, we'll talk about ecological resilience, we'll talk a little bit about management and restoration of prairies, but really we're going to talk about natural history and, and kind of stories about that. So I want to talk, start out talking about the fact that when you talk to people about nature, um, most people would envision something like mountains or streams falling through rocks 
for some reason, nature has a lot to do with rocks and water for a lot of people. And when you get into the center of North America and a lot of the agricultural fields, people don't think about nature being around them and close by often as much as they think about it somewhere else that they have to go to to see. And if they do think about prairies, which they don't often, uh, at least people around me, sorry, my slides are jumping on, on me for some reason. Um, if they do think about prairies, they tend to think about something that looks like this in their minds, which is kind of boring, drab, mostly grass, maybe a few other things, but not a lot of interest there. Um, nothing that you definitely would want to walk out into and explore. And of course, part of the problem with that is that they're just not looking in the right places or looking close enough to see what prairies have to offer. A lot of prairie attractiveness is subtle and it's no less beautiful for that, but you do have to kind of look for it. And sometimes it's a beauty that grows on you over time rather than something that just kind of jumps out at you at first glance. Although prairies can be that kind of attractive at times. You know, there's, you can have these explosions of color and there are some areas of topography that can get your attention. Um, but in general, our mountain ranges are the skies over prairies rather than actual mountains. Um, we do have rocks in some prairies and we have water in some prairies, but we don't really have, again, what people tend to think of when they think of nature. So part of our job as people who care about prairies is to change the way people think about nature uh, from a landscape scale. But the other way that people identify with nature tends to be, oh, sorry, I forgot one more, uh, which is that prairies are pretty tough to beat in terms of sunrises. You don't see the sun pop up on the hazy horizon in the mountains very often. So the other way people identify with nature tends to be with big animals. Um, and we have those in the prairies, of course. Not, not in all prairies do we have all the big animals anymore, but uh, there are certainly places you can go see bison. Uh, deer are a lot easier to find than bison in a lot of prairies. And if you scale down just a little bit, you can find things like prairie dogs and ground squirrels and coyotes and foxes and some of those sort of medium-sized animals that are still around. They're, they're not really hard to see. If you look hard enough, you go to the right places, you can see them. Uh, birds are maybe more accessible. So there are a lot of people who are bird watchers that uh, really enjoy seeing a lot of different kinds of birds. Prairies don't have maybe the diversity of bird life that you might see in a in an eastern deciduous woodland or a pine savanna or any of those woodland habitats, but there's plenty of diversity, including these upland sandpipers that are shorebirds that nest in the middle of the grasslands, uh, or species like dixistles, um, kind of a large sparrow-like bird. Looks like a metal arc, but isn't quite. A lot of birds in grasslands, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately for them, uh, are really well camouflaged. They're not brightly colored. Um, they're not a cardinal. They're not a blue grosbeak, but they are really well suited for the life that they live. But again, the beauty tends to be more subtle. So landscapes and large vertebrates tend to be how people think about nature. But if you think about the pyramid of life, and this is just a rough illustration of this, but it's fairly accurate. When you think about the number of species in the world, vertebrates make up a really tiny little piece of that. And the bulk of the important functions in prairies and other ecosystems tend to come from the much more diverse communities of plants and invertebrates that we have. But they don't get a lot of attention. And I think part of our job, again, as, as people interested in the conservation of prairie is to change that. And so what I want to spend the bulk of the presentation doing today is talking about why they're important, why we should care, um, but most of all, why they're interesting, because I think that's the key. We can, we can tell people about the function of things, but that's not as sexy as, as why something is interesting or fascinating or why you should care about it just because it's neat. So let's start with plants, and we'll start with one that is getting a lot of attention these days, which is milkweed. And of course, if you talk about milkweed, 
we're not just talking about one species of milkweed. And I'm, uh, I appreciate Carolyn's help this week. Uh, I had her track down some numbers for me of how many species of milkweeds and other things that we'll talk about here are documented for Saskatchewan. Uh, and as she told me, this, these aren't necessarily accurate numbers. This is the best she could find. And there's probably some inventory that still needs to be done both in Saskatchewan and Nebraska where I'm from. But the point of these slides is not that here's the exact number of species of each of these, but that there's a pretty nice diversity of, of life. Uh, and I think if you mention milkweed to somebody on the street in town, they tend to think of one or two species maybe of milkweed, probably something tall with a pink flower. But there's a lot more than that. If they do identify with milkweed, it's probably because of monarch butterflies, which is great. Uh, monarchs have been getting a lot of attention lately, which they deserve. And that has helped us talk about pollinators. It's helped us talk about the importance of plant diversity and a lot of other things. But milk or monarchs are not the only species of invertebrates who have figured out how to deal with the toxin that is in the latex of milkweed plants. Um, think about things like the longhorn milkweed beetle, or you can think about things like the common uh, or the giant milkweed bug. Um, there's a range of maybe a dozen or 15 other invertebrate species that specialize on milkweeds or close relatives of milkweeds. They can deal with that toxic latex, which is not sap. It's a separate system of plant material in a plant. Um, and so there's this whole community that, that comes around milkweed plants just in terms of what eats it. And that's, that's not counting all the things that feed on the, the pollen and nectar of the plant, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So jumping gears quickly to sunflowers. Sunflowers is another group of species that is fairly diverse. Um, in Nebraska, we have nine different species of sunflowers. Saskatchewan has at least seven. And that is just the species that are in the helianthus genus. But with sunflowers, there's a whole range of other things that look a lot like sunflowers. They've got similar form, similar shape, color. Um, and they, some of them are pretty closely related. Some of them are less closely related. But uh, they, they can be used in the same way. And one of the great things about sunflowers is that they make their pollen and nectar, for example, readily available to the animals that want to access them. They don't hide them inside a folded flower um, that you have to have a specialized skill to get to. They just sort of set up a platform and say, here's a bunch of food. And so this is an example of a bee that specializes on sunflowers and feeds on the pollen and nectar of sunflowers and uses it to, this, this bee's feeding herself, but also gathering pollen to take back to her nest. And there are a lot of other species of invertebrates that have found that same attractiveness to the easily accessible pollen and nectar, including this, this tree cricket, and when you have any kind of abundance like that in nature, um, the other thing that happens is predators adapt to that. And so you have things like crab spiders that would be sitting on a flower waiting for something that they know inevit inevitably will come and try to feed on that sunflower. And then later in the summer, or later in the fall, when the sunflowers make their seeds, they've got some of the most nutritious and, and uh, biggest seeds out there in the prairie and so they're really attractive to all kinds of wildlife including a lot of birds that flock to those sunflowers for the food that they provide into the fall and even into the winter sometimes. And sunflowers come in both annual and perennial form. The perennial sunflowers tend to be fairly stable in population over the over time. They'll increase and decrease somewhat but the annuals can really explode in years following a fire or some kind of a severe disturbance. This is a photo from the sand hills of Nebraska, kind of north central Nebraska. And this is the year after uh, 2012, which was our worst single year drought in recorded history. And in 2012, everything on the landscape was pretty crispy and brown by mid-July. Um, the area here in the photo actually had a severe wildfire go through. There was about 70,000 acres or so. But the entire landscape of the sand hills, which is about 12 million acres of mostly intact prairie, almost all of it looked like this in 2013, the year after that, that big drought. The grass community was weakened, and one of the species that took advantage of the rainfall the next year in the open space 
uh, from those suppressed grasses was these sunflowers. And so they were really important in carrying the ecology of the site, uh, and, you know, providing resources for pollinators and wildlife, but also livestock, because even though the grass was sort of weakened, um, sunflowers are pretty nutritious for cattle, especially at different times of the year. The leaves are good in the early part of the year, the flower buds as they're coming out, the flowers themselves. So uh, there are a lot of things that benefited from sunflowers that year. So we were really glad to have this particular species of sunflower in, that, in the sand hills in 2013. Something else interesting about sunflowers is they're a, one of the species of plants that has the ability to produce what's called extra floral nectar. And extra floral nectar is a sweet substance, much like the nectar you think of in flowers, but it's produced from other parts of the plant. And so in this case, those shiny little dots on the flower to the left of the ants are extra floral nectar that the, the plant is basically secreting from pores in the bracts underneath the flower. And ants tend to have a sweet, a sweet tooth. And so this is a, a relationship built between sunflowers and ants in which the sunflower produces this extra floral nectar to attract ants. The ants come and feed on the nectar, and then the sunflower basically gets the benefit of a swarm of predators uh, all over itself that it helps to keep herbivores off of it so it doesn't get completely eaten up. Well, that's the hope. Um, you can see in this photo it hasn't completely stopped the, the petals of the flower from being eaten, but I guess we just imagine that without the ants there it would be much worse. So there's neat relationships there with ants and sunflowers, um, and again, whenever there's an abundance of resources, it attracts predators like crab spiders, which are waiting for those ants. So speaking of nectar, uh, the regular kind of nectar that's produced on the, the front of the flower or the, uh, the business end of the flower, I guess, is really important for pollinated insects. And pollinated insects, when you think about pollinated insects, you usually think about bees. They're the most effective and most abundant of pollinators uh, in general for most species. And when the public thinks about bees, they probably mostly think about honeybees. So honeybees are important. Honeybees are in decline. Honeybee declines have helped us get attention for the larger issues surrounding pollinators, which has been really helpful. But of course, honeybees are just one of many, many species of, of bees in North America. And they're not native to North America. They were brought in as an agricultural uh, tool, basically. Uh, if people know more than one kind of bee, they probably can name at least the term bumblebee. And it's unlikely, though, that they can figure out or that they know how many kinds of bumblebees there might be. So in, I think in North America, there are something like 46 species of bumblebees. Nebraska's got a really diverse set of bumblebees in it. We have a, a lot of different topography and rainfall amounts from one corner to the other corners of the state. So we have 20 different bumblebee species that have been recorded in Nebraska. Saskatchewan, excuse me, has about eight at least. Um, but the point is it's a lot more than just one kind of bumblebee out there. And bumblebees are really important for a lot of different species of flowers. Uh, there are some flowers that rely on bumblebees and a few other bees that can do buzz pollination where they they vibrate their muscles uh, at a certain resonance that drops pollen out of anthers that otherwise wouldn't let the pollen go. But and apart from that, they're big, they're fuzzy, they can travel long distances, they're generalists, so they'll feed on a lot of different kinds of flowers. But at the same time, they have the, the flower consistency that most bees have, which means that they go from one sunflower to another sunflower or a prairie clover to another prairie clover. So they're not taking the wrong pollen from plant to plant. They're, they're really good about uh, carrying pollen from the same species to the same species across the landscape. So they're very effective. And beyond bumblebees, there are a lot of different other kinds of bees, most of them pretty small, uh, often green, sometimes brown or other colors. And at least in Nebraska, we don't have a great count of how many bee species we have. I don't know if Saskatchewan has better numbers, probably not. Um, they just, we don't have a lot of inventory yet on bees, but the guess is in Nebraska we're between 200 and 400 different species, maybe a little more. Um, in North America, it's it's much higher than that. 4,000 is a low number. It's probably closer to five or 6,000 different kinds of bees, which is a fairly startling number probably for for some people, and it's a number that I think we need to get 
the general public to think about more so they think beyond honeybees and maybe bumblebees. Because when you think about all these bees, a lot of them have really fascinating stories of their own. Most of them are solitary bees, meaning that they're not in a social system with a queen and workers uh, that, where they can split the labor up. It's mostly a single mom with a nest. Uh, she goes out, collects pollen and nectar, puts it together in kind of a little dough ball, sticks it down in her nest, which is usually either a burrow in the ground or, or uh, in a hollow stem, lays an egg, seals it up with that dough ball of pollen and nectar, and then repeats that process. So she has to find every day enough pollen and nectar to keep herself alive, but also to provision the nest that she's building so that when those eggs hatch, they have enough food to, to eat until they grow to be adults and then they, they come out and move on. When she's not out collecting pollen and nectar, she's at the entrance of that nest defending it from wasps or ants or other things that might come in and try to feed on those on those babies that she's trying to protect. So not all other bees are solitary. There are some of these smaller bees that are social or colonial, um, but they come in all different colors and shapes and sizes, some of which are really spectacular. As I said, a lot of them just have a little hole in the ground um, beneath which is a tunnel or a burrow that they have filled with eggs and pollen and nectar by the end of the season if things go well. Also, a lot of these bees are fairly generalist. Uh, I, I talked about that with bumblebees. They'll feed on a lot of different kinds of things. Um, some like that bee on the sunflower are more specialized within a group of, of plants that are related to each other. And then there are some like this one. This is a digger bee that is a specialist on this particular plant. So this is pitcher sage or salvia. And this particular species of bee will not feed on any other kind of plant besides this one. So if you want the bee, you've got to have the plant. And one of the cool things about this photo, besides the fact that I got really lucky uh, capturing a bee that's pretty sharp in the air, um, is that this plant was photographed in a restored prairie surrounded by crop fields for miles. And the photo was taken six or seven years after that that restored prairie was planted. So the closest population of pitcher sage is at least six or seven miles away, maybe much more than that. Um, and yet within the first six or seven years of, of existence, this bee was able to find and you know presumably start a population of its kind in the same prairie where its only host species uh, existed, which is pretty awesome. And my understanding of science's limited understanding of how that happens is that it's done through the scent of the flowers, but uh, there's a lot of guesswork involved in that because it's a hard thing to study. But it's a pretty neat thing to happen. All right, so sticking with the theme of pollination, we'll talk about a different plant, a different kind of relationship. This is yucca or soapweed. Uh, it's a really common plant in the sandhills of Nebraska um, and other parts of, that are kind of drier parts of prairies. There are a lot of species of wildlife, at least here, that rely on soapweed or yucca for habitat, mostly for the structure that it provides in prairies. Um, even in prairies where the grasses are really short because of grazing or other things. But lizards and birds and other wildlife utilize it for shade and protection. Um, things like lark sparrows commonly nest at the base of these, these plants because you can imagine a big spiky plant that provides shade and protection and cover is a pretty nice thing to find in the prairie. In addition to that, yucca have kind of a distinctive flower, um, both from a distance because they're nice and big, but even up close, if you look at them closely, the anthers are fairly small. They're fairly separated from the center of the flower. And they, because of this structure and, and a few other things, the only reason or the only way that this plant gets pollinated is it gets pollinated by the yucca moth. So there's a single species of moth that is the only insect that we know of that can pollinate yucca plants. And so yucca doesn't get pollinated unless it's by the yucca moth, and the yucca moth doesn't really feed on anything besides the yucca uh, plant, as larvae at least. 
So it's a mutualistic relationship. Both both animals benefit from their relationship, or both organisms, I guess, not animals. Um, and the way it works is that the moth will go over to those anthers and get the pollen and basically carry the pollen over to the stigma and physically stuff the pollen inside the opening there, which is how the pollen or the, the plant gets pollinated. And there's no other insect that has any reason to do that. If, I mean, other insects can come and get the pollen, but they're not going to get the pollen where it needs to go from the yucca plant's perspective. So the moth kind of goes out of its way to do that. Now, after the moth does that and puts the pollen inside the stigma there where it can get down into the ovaries, she also lays her eggs there. So this is where she benefits, is that the eggs of the moth, when they hatch, will have easy access to some young, developing, and very nutritious, tasty seeds of the yucca plant. So hooray for the caterpillars. They've got plenty of food to eat. But it wouldn't be a very mutualistic relationship if the caterpillars ate all the seeds, because then the plant doesn't get anything out of it. So the best, most fascinating part of this relationship is that in one way or another, and we don't know how it happens, we just know that it does happen, the flower, the plant, can sense how many eggs have been laid in its flowers. And if there are too many eggs laid to the point where it just won't be able to produce any viable seeds at the end of the process, it simply aborts the flower and the flower falls to the ground. And it doesn't waste its resources on that, on that part of the flower anymore. It focuses on other flowers that hopefully don't have as many eggs laid in it. So you tell me how a plant knows how, how, that, how to count the number of eggs laid in it. I don't have any idea how it happens, but it's a pretty fascinating thing. All right, so sticking with pollination, but bouncing back to milkweeds just for a minute. The pollination process of milkweeds is one of the most interesting things I've ever read about. Um, if you look closely at milkweed flowers, they're much different structurally, of course, than other flowers. And there's a little slit um, right on the side of the flower, and inside those little slits is where the pollen is in a milkweed plant. And the pollen in a milkweed flower is not a, a powder, a loose powder like it is on most plants. It's actually kind of a gel pack. It's a, it's a collection of pollen stuck together in a little packet called a pollinia. And the way pollination happens is that an insect has to walk around on this, on this flower. So let's talk about, for example, a wasp that I photographed walking around on this swamp milkweed a few years ago. Pollination happens if that wasp happens to accidentally let its foot slip into one of the slits on the side of that flower. And then if the flower is fortunate, as that insect pulls its leg out, it hooks the pollinia on the end of its leg and pulls the pollinia out with it. Now, there's no reason for an insect to do this on purpose. In fact, sometimes insects lose their legs to milkweed flowers because they get stuck and they can't get out and they pull their leg off. So there's no advantage to the insect for doing this. So it seems like a crazy strategy that'll never work. Um, but if you look closely at insects that are walking around on or near milkweed, you can see those pollinia stuck to the, to the tips of the, the feet or the legs. So if you look here, you can see at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, on three legs or four legs. Um, and there's probably more on the other legs, you assume. So it does happen. Now, we're only halfway there because the, the plenia have been pulled out of the flower. But of course, in, in, uh, if, if pollination is going to be complete, those plenia have to get back into a different flower in order to make pollination happen. So you have to imagine the same insect has to be walking around on the flower, on a milkweed flower, and accidentally stick the same foot back into a flower, into the same slit accidentally, and then pull it out and this time leave that pollinia behind in the exact right place to make pollination happen. So it's a series of accidents that doesn't seem like it should work at all and yet you walk around and you look at milkweed plants in the fall and a lot of them have pods and seeds so apparently it works really well. Here's the same wasp by the way uh, trying to clean the pollinia off of its foot so it's not unaware that the pollinia is there but it doesn't seem very easy to get off. I watched this one work at it for a while and and she never did manage to get it off. Um, 
and wasps are not the only ones. I mean, really any insect that hangs around on milkweed uh, ends up with plenty on its feet if it walks around long enough. So it seems like a crazy strategy, but it's one that seems to work. All right. I don't know if you can tell what kind of insect this is, but uh, this group of insects has the most diverse number of species in North America. So your first guess might be beetles, and you'd be right if you were talking about the entire world, because the tropics is full of beetle diversity, and there are more species of beetles worldwide than any other group of insects. But in North America, it's not beetles. It's actually flies. And there are 37,000 species of flies in North America. I want to repeat that because it's that important. There are 37,000 different species of flies in North America. These are documented species. So there's probably more than that. I mean, there's almost assuredly much more than that. But these are the, this is the number that we have documented, um, which is a staggering number, really. So how many of those can you name? I can name about 10, probably. Um, here's one. This is a, a little flower fly. I don't actually know what species this is, but flower flies tend to hang around on flowers of different plants and feed on the pollen. This one's actually on a grass plant rather than a, uh, a plant that actually needs insect pollination, which is okay because flower flies, most of these, like this at least, are not very fuzzy, so they're not actually picking up pollen and carrying it from place to place. They're mostly stealing pollen from the plants. So they're not great pollinators, but they are pollen feeders. There are other flies, though, that are more effective pollinators. They're fuzzy. They travel from plant to plant, much like bees do. They don't have maybe the same consistency or efficiency as bees, but they can still do the job. You can see lots of different kinds of flies on lots of different kinds of flowers. Um, here are three different flies on uh, the same species of pussy toes or Antonaria uh, here in Nebraska. So there's a lot of diversity just among the kinds of flies that are uh, pollen feeders, which is a pretty small subset of flies overall. This is a different kind of fly that is a nectar feeder, um, maybe also a pollen feeder, but it's a it's called a bee fly. It does have the kind of fuzzy body of a bee, but it's got this long, stiff proboscis that it can use to reach nectar that many of other flies can't reach, many other insects can't reach. It can feed by hovering in front of the plant and just sort of sliding its proboscis down into the throat of a flower to get the nectar, or it can land on a sunflower platform like other insects and, and do it the easy way. Um, we're going to return to the bee fly in a little while because there's more to the story, but for now, that's that's what bee flies do is they, they are pollen nectar feeders and they can be relatively efe efficient pollinators. Uh, other flies, this is called a crane fly. Crane flies look like huge mosquitoes, but they're not at all harmful to people or other animals as, as adults. As, as larvae, they tend to feed on the roots of plants. Uh, as adults, they might eat a little nectar now and then, but they mostly are non-feeding. They're short-lived as adults. They just sort of mate and lay eggs and die. Um, but you see crane flies around. They have really long legs, really long wings, and they look a lot like giant mosquitoes. I think my favorite, oh, and by the way, mosquitoes also are flies. So. They're, they're in the order diptera. They're, they count as flies. There's a lot of different kinds of mosquitoes. But my, my favorite fly has got to be the robber fly. And the robber flies come in a lot of different shapes and sizes as well. Uh, they're predators. Some of them are mimics. Some of them are mimics of bees, for example. They look a lot like a bee so they can uh, get close to their prey um, and be a little bit camouflaged or costumed. This one just looks like a mean predator. And you can see in its mouth it's caught a leafhopper which it's sucking the life out of literally right now. So robber flies tend to hunt from perches, um, but not always, where they'll sit and they'll watch for something to come by and then they'll zip out and catch it and then return to some place they can sit and, and eat and digest its, their prey. They've got huge eyes, long tails. Uh, they tend to be fairly fuzzy and they're just extremely quick. We'll come back to robber flies in a little while too, actually. Okay, so switching gears, let's talk about herbivores, things that eat plants, things that eat the leaves of plants uh, specifically. And if you're going to talk about herbivores and invertebrates, grasshoppers are really a good place to start. Um, they're a large group, uh, meaning there's a lot of different species, but they're also large in size relative to a lot of other insects. In Nebraska, at least, 
we have at least 108 different species of grasshoppers. Saskatchewan has at least 85 species of grasshoppers. So that's a lot of species of grasshoppers. And I think like bees, most of the public would think grasshopper and think grasshopper. Um, but when you start looking at grasshoppers, there's a huge variety of, of colors and shapes and sizes of them. And along with that, there's a lot of variation in the diet and the behavior of these grasshoppers. Um, some of them are pretty crazy looking. They are sometimes specialists on grasses. On a, on, sometimes they're specialists on a particular kind of broadleaf plant. Sometimes they're generalists, they'll eat anything. Uh, big range in the, in the kinds of diets that they have. There are a handful of them that can be crop pests. Um, and those are mostly species that are, you know, they're native species, but they've adapted very well to these monocultures of plants that are attractive to them. Um, the largest one, at least in Nebraska, is called the Plains Lubber. And this is a photo of it here. It's a wingless grasshopper, so the little tiny stubby brown with black spots wing there, that's, that's as big as it gets on a lubber. They're not a flight, a flying grasshopper. So they walk and hop along the ground. Um, the common name other than Plains Lubber is the homesteader. Uh, they're really big. They're hard to miss when you're out in the prairie. They're, not that they're not well camouflaged, but if you see them move, it's pretty hard to not see them. They can, they can be the size of a small mouse. Probably the most attractive color-wise grasshopper, though, is called the painted grasshopper. There's some other names for it. Um, these are relatively common in western prairies. I assume that they're in Saskatchewan, but I don't know that for sure. This is another flightless grasshopper, so this is an adult that doesn't have wings that it can fly with. Just gorgeous coloration, though. And this is an example of a species that's much more specialized in its diet than you might expect with grasshoppers. This is a uh, uh, sage wart grasshopper, which is feeding on or sitting on here the the main plant in its diet. I guess it will feed on other plants if it has to, but it, it really likes to feed on sage wart, and why not? It looks just like it. It's really well camouflaged against it. Uh, it's a pretty good idea to be camouflaged uh, just like your favorite food item. And other grasshoppers that are camouflaged for the habitat that they live in. So here's a a grasshopper that hangs out in bare sand a lot, and uh, it's pretty tough to see when it's not moving. These are a lot of, a lot of fun to chase with a camera as long as nobody's watching you, because most of the time when I'm chasing these with a the camera, I get really close, and then just when I'm about in range, they fly, and then I stand up and walk over to where they are, kneel down, and then it flies again, and I can chase these for a lot longer than I'd like to admit before I get a photo a lot of times. And a lot of these uh, really well camouflaged grasshoppers in, in open sandy areas are bandwing grasshoppers, which have these really attractive wing colorations to them, uh, usually yellows or reds with some stripes. And they have this nictitating sound. Uh, no, that's not the word. I can't think of the word. Anyway, um, they have this kind of a loud clacking sound as they fly. So that you, when they take off at your feet, they go clack, 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 clack across the ground, which is probably both a predator avoidance, but it's also a communication strategy that they use uh, among, among other grasshoppers. And then that 108 or 85 species of grasshoppers doesn't count some of the close relatives like katydids. So katydids are very closely related to grasshoppers, but they have long antenna that are longer than their bodies. And so if you see something that looks like a grasshopper, but the antenna are, is, are as long as their body or more, that's a katydid or a cricket, could be a cricket. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of katydids. A lot of the, the nymphs and katydids, uh, the younger stages of them, look like they shouldn't be able to move around like they do because they've got antenna that are super long and it seems like they would get tangled up everywhere they try to go. Another fun thing about katydids is that they hear out of their elbows, essentially. So if you look at this one and look at that front leg, uh, that bends down around the head, kind of that big hole in the in near the crook of the, the elbow there, that's the, the opening that it uses to listen with and hear with. And you, again, you can tell it's katydid because it has long antenna even when they're sticking right at you. So grasshoppers, katydids, tree crickets are really abundant. They're important in terms of controlling vegetation growth. But they're also, because of their abundance and size, really important as a food source for a lot of wildlife, including birds. <laughs>
um, they can be as abundant or they can be abundant enough that their total biomass can equal that of uh, bison or cattle uh, that are appropriately stocked in a prairie, which if you stop and think about that, that's pretty astounding to think about that much biomass uh, lumbering across the grasslands, but they're small enough that you just don't notice them very often. All right, and this brings us back just for a second to bee flies because different species of bee flies as larvae actually feed on uh, other insect species. So they're a predator as a larva. And this particular species of bee fly here feeds on grasshopper larvae. And so grasshoppers lay their eggs in the ground. They kind of stick their tail into the ground and, and lay eggs in a, in a packet underneath the ground. And when bee flies see that happening, they hover above and they'll flick eggs down near the entrance of the little tunnels that the grasshoppers are laying their eggs in. So that when the bee fly larva hatches, it can crawl down into that tunnel and then it feeds on the either the eggs or the developing larvae of the, of the uh, grasshoppers. So bee flies, in addition to being pollinators, can also help control pollinate or grasshopper populations, uh, including some of the ones that can be pest species for rangeland or cropland. All right, I'm going to do some quick hitters here um, and then we'll be done. Thistles. Thistles are really important. Uh, they get a bad name because there are some that are weedy. In Nebraska, there are 10 different species of thistle. There's nine in Saskatchewan. At least in Nebraska, uh, half of our species are native, and the ones that are have a real white color on the bottom of the leaf from the fine hairs on the bottom of the leaf. They're great pollinator resources, including the ones, the thistle species that are noxious in Nebraska, uh, like this musk thistle. You can, as we're chopping thistles this time of year, we have to, to flush the pollinators off of them first, which feels kind of bad. The native ones, uh, again, have a white understory. This is an example of one that's called the plat thistle in Nebraska. It's not a pink flowered thistle, which is fairly unusual. A big favorite with bees, including this uh, American bumblebee, or Bombus pensylvanicus, which is declining uh, pretty quickly and in the eastern part of its range, but it's still pretty secure in the sand hills of Nebraska. They're really important in the fall for migrating monarch butterflies. The tall thistles, at least in Nebraska, are blooming just as the monarchs are coming through. And uh, if you take a picture of a monarch on a flower that time of year, there's a really good chance it's going to be on a tall thistle. One of the other things that's fun about thistles, though, besides the fact that they have seeds that are, you know, kind of like sunflowers, they're big and nutritious for wildlife, they have a relationship with gold goldfinches. And if you look at this picture carefully, you can see down toward the bottom, there's a goldfinch nest right here in the, in the thistle plant itself, which works out well because goldfinches time their nesting to be a little later than a lot of other birds so that they can use the, the down or the, the silk from thistle seeds as part of their nest building, but they also feed those young seeds to their, to their young. It's an important part of the food for goldfinches as they grow. So there's a, a kind of a neat relationship there between thistles and goldfinches as well. One other thing I found out about thistles a few years ago is that they can be death traps for insects, um, which seems sort of ironic. But if you think about it or if you look into it more, it makes sense. So what happens is the bottom, the bracts or the, the underside of a flower are really sticky. There's a sticky substance produced there. And it's not so much that it attracts insects, but the theory, I think, the best theory I've heard anyway, is it's, it's there to protect them from things like ants that are crawling up from the ground to steal nectar without actually doing any pollination. And so if you're an ant and you want to get to that flower, the only way to get there is by crawling through this area of really stickiness. And so you can see here, all these, all these insects on this thistle are dead. They got stuck and couldn't, couldn't get out of there and they died in place. And that includes, unfortunately, this, this bee on the right side that probably is a male bee that looked for a place to spend the night and got stuck. And I've seen pretty good sized insects stuck on these flowers, including this, this little prairie cicada. So anyway, it's just something I hadn't known about thistles until a few years ago. And we're going to finish up talking about predators. We're going to start with um, tiger beetles, just because they look, they look really cool. And if you were going to design an alien for a movie about aliens, uh, tiger beetles would be great models for that. There are 29 different species of tiger beetles in Nebraska. There's at least 18 in Saskatchewan. They're gorgeous, really diverse in color. 
and their mouth parts have got to be the coolest thing in nature. Um, here's one that just finished off an ant that it caught. They hunt in open ground where they can run around really quickly and fly um, to get close to an insect before they can jump on it and eat it. So they're incredible predators. They're not real big, but they're incredible predators, but they're also not immune from predation themselves. So let's flip right back to robber flies, uh, complete that circle. So this is a robber fly that caught this shiny blue tiger beetle as I was trying to photograph the tiger beetle. Uh, the tiger beetle took off because I got a little too close, and as soon as it left the ground, the tiger beetle also took off from nearby and just basically crashed into it in the air or tumbled to the ground with it and uh, made pretty short work of this, of this predator. And then we'll finish up predators with spiders, because you can't really talk about invertebrate predators without talking about spiders. And spiders hunt in different ways. Some of them are web makers, um, including the, the big yellow and black spiders that people see in the gardens. This is one that's guarding its egg sac at the bottom of the web. A lot of spiders, though, are more difficult to see. Uh, a lot of them are really well camouflaged. And there's a whole group of spiders that are sort of free-wandering hunting spiders. Um, probably the best known of those are the wolf spiders, which have these incredible sensory hair systems, which help them sense the organisms around them. They can tell from the pattern of wings or the pattern of footfalls what kind of an insect or creature is walking nearby. Um, they're also known for carrying their young around with them. They carry an egg sac around with them. And when the young hatch, they carry the young around with them for quite a while. This is one I just photographed actually a couple of weeks ago here in Nebraska. Big female wolf spider with I don't know how many uh, of her babies are sitting on top of her. And there are other spiders that hunt more by ambush. So crab spiders are a great example of that. They've got extra long front legs. They can sit and wait for an insect that gets too close to them. Uh, and they just reach out and nab them with their front legs. Uh, there's a whole group of crab spiders that hunt on flowers, like we talked about earlier. And there's other spiders that are sort of in between. Um, so jumping spiders, for example, which are the cute teddy bears of the spider world. They're, they are free moving, they move around, but they also are sort of ambush predators. So a lot of times you'll see them on a flower on the side of my house, uh, sort of creep closer and closer to, a, to an area where there's some flies moving around, and then they wait till the fly gets close enough and then they jump and, and catch it. And they can leave a piece of silk behind them as a safety thread so that if they fall, they get caught, they can climb right back up their safety, safety rope again. Uh, so this makes great toys or playthings for my kids. Uh, this is my son, Daniel, who really likes to play with uh, jumping spiders and catches them and has them jump around from hand to hand. And again, they're cute little teddy bears. They're the most amazing little spiders. Okay, so to wrap all this up, the diversity of species, and again, is, is made up mostly by little things. And that diversity of species leads to a wide diversity of functions. And in ecosystems, the more diversity of function you have, the more resilient you are as an ecosystem. So that if something like drought or fire or disease outbreak or anything else happens in a prairie, and take some species out of the equation temporarily or permanently, you want to have a diversity of species so that you have something else that can fill in uh, when something goes away. So diversity is incredibly important for resilience. It's also important to recognize that resilience doesn't mean stability in terms of something that always looks the same. Resilience means that a prairie can maintain its, its ability to do what prairies do and provide habitat for prairie species, for example. Um, so this is, this is one prairie that through time looks very differently. So in years where we burn and graze it, um, for example, here the grasses are really short. The cattle are eating mostly the grasses. They're leaving a lot of the taller wildflowers. Um, after a year of that kind of intensive grazing, you get a lot of other flowers that that show up and take advantage of the fact that the grasses are weak for a little while. And you can get this big abundance of pollinator friendly flowers or sometimes other things like ragweeds. But that's a short lived phenomenon and then it changes again as the grasses recover and different times of year it looks different. So prairies are resilient because they're changeable, because they're dynamic. And because they have this incredible diversity of little things that maintain focus or maintain the function. So 
when we think about prairies and conservation, we have to think about those little things. We have to think about things like ants and other invertebrates and microfauna in the soil that keep soil healthy. We have to keep think about bees and other pollinators that keep plant communities going. Uh, we have to think about the predators that regulate all those populations of all the other little things out there. When we do restoration projects, uh, the more diversity we can build in, uh, the better. So for example, using high numbers of species in a prairie restoration from seed, uh, a lot of our restorations here, we're using between 180 and 220 different species of plants. We work really hard to get as much diversity out there as we can. And then when you have that diversity, managing with a combination of fire and grazing and other strategies, uh, creating a lot of different types of habitat structure so that uh, in a landscape or in a fairly small area of prairie, you can find the different habitat types that, other, that all the different species out there are looking for. So you can maintain all the populations of all those species. And it's not just out on the landscape. In, in our backyards, um, you know, using a diversity of native plants right there in our yard uh, can make a big difference to pollinators and also other kinds of insect species and small creatures. So as we work with our kids and teach them about nature, um, we have to not just focus on the big things like bison and wolves and elk and things like that, uh, but also on the small things that actually make it work. Because bison are really interesting and really fun to look at, but it's really the little things that are going to save the world. And that is my presentation. So thanks for listening. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Um, now, if anyone has any questions for Chris, uh, you can type them in the webinar pop-up, and I'll read them out to Chris. Uh, so we'll just wait a few seconds, I guess. And if there's no questions, that means it was a very comprehensive presentation, right? <laughs> right. Um, so there's one question from Matthew. Are any of the species you mentioned at risk? Uh, yes. So if, as an example, um, bee species, there are a lot of native bee species that uh, we know are at risk, that we know populations are declining. Um, I mentioned the one, uh, Bombus pensylvanicus, which is having a hard time, especially in the east, but there are a lot of bumblebee species that are having trouble. Uh, a lot of the other species, there are, there are definitely invertebrates that are endangered species. We have the uh, American burying beetle is one that we just found at one of our properties this week, so that's kind of top of mind for me, which is a in the United States, a, a listed, federal listed species. Um, but of course, there are a lot of species we don't know enough about to know whether they are declining or not. Uh, we just don't have a lot of inventory information on these little things. So um, there probably are a lot more of them that are at risk than we are aware of. And the more we study them, I think the more uh, conservation risk we find for some of these things. Sure, certainly some of them are not. I mean, there are a lot of species that are very adaptable. You know, a lot of the grasshopper species have adapted really well to human populations and are you know, now seen as pest species because they're so abundant. But there are also grasshopper species that are you know, very specialized and those are the ones that are most, most likely to become at risk. Okay, uh, we have another question from Amanda. During native prairie restorations, have you ever introduced insects into the landscape? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, we have not. We've certainly thought about it. Um, I guess where we're at, we still have enough prairie around that we feel like there are ways for these insects to get back. Um, you know, I mentioned that one bee species that was able to find its host plant. We've done quite a bit of work the last several years on our restorations here um, 
looking to see uh, the whole point of our restoration work. When we take crop field and put it in the prairie, we're doing that to make the adjacent remnant prairies, the unplowed prairies, more viable. So we'll do, we'll take a remnant prairie that's small and isolated and we'll do restoration next to it with the idea that that prairie will act as a bigger, more connected unit. Um, and so in order for that to be successful, we've got to be able to see the animals that are living in that remnant prairie move into the restored prairie. So over the last several years, we've been looking at things like ants and bees and small mammals and grasshoppers and katydids to see if we have all the same species in the restoration that are in the, the adjacent remnant. And, you know, we've still got a ways to go, but so far the answer has been resoundingly positive that the vast majority of species that we find in the remnant prairies are making their way into the restored prairies. But again, that's, that's, you know, two sites that are right next to each other. So if there's something where you're isolated, then I think that becomes a really interesting question uh, to think about taking a sweep net and going to a, a prairie nearby and catching a bunch of insects and bringing them in. I don't necessarily have any objection to it, but it's a much more complicated issue than uh, just is it good or bad. So we've, we've had some good conversations about it. We've never gotten to the point where we felt like we needed to do it. So that's where we're at. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Sherry. Are your practices regulated by the government, local or federal? Uh, yes, to some extent. We have to get a permit to do our fires. So we have to work with local authorities there. Um, you know, when we do our restoration work, if we're doing anything with wetlands, of course there's wetland regulations we have to work with to get permits for that. Um, but a lot of it is not, really. Um, you know, the grazing work that we do, uh, seed harvest, as long as we're on land where we have permission, uh, none of that is really regulated. So especially, you know, I work for a, a private nonprofit organization, and so we're relatively flexible and free to do things the way that makes sense for us. But there are some things that are regulated for sure. Okay, and the next question is from Michael. Are there concerns about introduced species threatening native ones? plants or invertebrates? Yes, that, absolutely. And, uh, you know, weeds or invasive plants get a lot of attention, and for good reason. There's a lot of invasive plants that are giving us all kinds of headaches down here. Um, but, you know, introduced animals are also a big problem. Feral hogs are becoming an issue in the southern part of the, of the United States, but also moving fairly far north now. We've been lucky in Nebraska that our uh, state Game and Parks Commission is really good about uh, catching them right as soon as they show up. So feral hogs have not become a major issue here in Nebraska yet, but we have um, you know, invasive insects. We're going to lose all of our green ash here pretty quick to the emerald ash borer, which is now shown up in the state. Um, so we're already planning to not have ash trees anymore. There are insect species that we've brought in ourselves as biocontrol that have gone rogue and are causing problems now. Some of them are attacking our native thistles, which I talked about as an important plant. They're eating most of the seeds out of those native thistles and suppressing those populations. So yeah, there's all kinds of, of invasive problems. And I, and I would say it's, it's important to separate non-native from invasive because there are a fair number of non-native species, animals and plants both, that are really fairly harmless. Um, and in some cases beneficial, that have just sort of embedded themselves into our native communities and, and made themselves a useful part of the community. Um, but there are also quite a few that have become problematic. Okay, and I think that's our last question. Uh, so thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time to give a presentation today and answer our questions. I Absolutely, would like... it was fun. Good. I'm glad you had fun. I think everyone enjoyed it, especially all those wonderful pictures. Um, I would like to mention again that in-kind support for this project was given by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the Native Prairie Speaker Series is undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of the Environment and Climate Change Canada. There will be a short survey once the webinar is over, so please fill them out to help with our granting reports, and um, they'll also help us improve our events and future presentations. 
Um, thank you again for attending this webinar, and don't forget to keep your eyes open for our next webinar in July. Uh, so take care, enjoy Native Prairie Appreciation Week, and have a good rest of your day.